Lovely. So, um, hi everyone. Today we're speaking with Polly McGee, author of The Good Hustle um, and The Dogs of India, I might add. And um, Polly, how are you today? I'm great, Dave. How are you going? Fantastic. Thank you. Fantastic. Where am I talking to you from? I've noticed some beautiful images in your background. I have landed back in my home base of Tasmania, so I'm sitting at home in my little office slash shrine <laughs> and it's nice Warm to have been travelling so much that it's good to sort of get my feet under the desk for a little while as it were. Fantastic. So warm, warm and cosy in the um, the mild Tassie winter. What sort of temperature have <laughs> you got down there at the moment? It's about two degrees. <laughs> Feels about like two. I'm in my office. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I, I hail from the Mornington Peninsula in, in Rye in Melbourne and it can be seven degrees in the morning in Melbourne and it can be two down there as well just because you've got so much water around you. So I think so that's I'm, it. Yeah. We're I'm in a feeling, I'm feeling it. climate. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm feeling, I'm feeling a connection. Right. <laughs> right. We're connected by our frostbite. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. So thanks so much for chatting today. And I was just, um, look, I was just wondering that um, if you can tell me a little bit about um, about how the good hustle has been going for you, how the book's been going, and um, and I suppose um, from a particular interest viewpoint, just um, what the response has been like to your audio book. Well, look, the book's been going fantastically well. I'm just I'm so pleased with it. But probably more than from a commercial perspective, I'm really pleased with what it's doing to the people that read it, or more likely what they're doing to themselves. And as a sort of writer of books that, that really encourage people to wake up and sort of transform their own lives to a place of compassion and contentment and equanimity. I'm really happy to see that being so well received in a business context, which isn't normally the context we speak about spiritual matters in. But I'm also really happy to see that it's so strongly resonating with people who are just saying things like, you know, I feel like you wrote this for me and this page 47, that's my life. So it's a really, it's a really nice experience. But I have to say that for me, the experience of making it an audio book was just really magical and and it's like I, I like to imagine myself with people on a bus or sitting in bed or somewhere just whispering in their ear and just sort of telling them all these secrets of the book. So I feel there's a real intimacy to voice and sound that although you can get that from the page, I think there's, yeah. there's a moment of connection that I really feel and I felt it when I was recording. I had these moments where like the hairs on the back of my neck could stand up and I think, oh, this is an important part of the book, really focus on the way you're communicating this and the emotion you're putting into it because this is going to just be something that someone will just be changed by. So it was just magical, Dave. Oh, that's fantastic. That's, a, that's really interesting you picked up on that um, intimacy idea, Polly, because other, other of my authors have mentioned the same thing and I, I think um, one of them summed it up really nicely by saying that it's... Uh, she had some feedback from some of the folks who listened to her audio book and she said it's really just like it's like listening to a friend so yeah. it has this this quality of um, of um, you know just being being close being close to someone and 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 really having a private a private conversation where as you say I guess you get the same with a book but you miss those those elements of the author's voice and obviously you, you can be pausing and there's intonation and all sorts of excitement but Curious to also hear from you that you actually had that feeling um, when you were doing the narration, when you were recording the narration yourself, that there probably aren't that many occasions where you're actually in a situation where you're actually reading um, reading from your own book and actually going back and recapturing those ideas that you wrote down once and they come back in a different form. There's, yeah, there's something think, else that comes back in that regard. I think that's really true, Dave, and certainly with my first novel, Dogs of India, I didn't read that. I auditioned for it, but I did... <laughs> I didn't get the audition, which was really funny because they came back and said, you know, you sound too much like a newsreader. And I was working for the ABC at the time and I'd smashed up the oh, audition okay. just before I'd gone on air. And I wasn't reading news, but I was doing a, a current affair show. So I clearly <laughs> sounded too much like Tracy Grimshaw. And I, was, I had a lot of feedback from people who knew me who got the book who said, oh, we were so disappointed when it wasn't your voice because we wanted to hear you telling us the story. So when I had the opportunity to to have this book done as an audio book, I was absolutely staunch mm. that I was going to read it myself because yeah. I mean, with, an, with a fictional book, there is a skill. You do need to be a voice actor, which I'm clearly not. But with a book like The Good Hustle, which was not only my professional experience, but it's also a really personal story about my own enlightenment and awakening and that pathway and what that's looked like so far. And it would have been really, really strange to have someone else reading about, out about my life and my family and my hopes and fears. So it was very much that I was absolutely determined. And of course, 
because it was my story, the intonation and the, the sound of it was right for them. So what I found too, and I'd be interested to know if other authors have this experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Once you haven't written a book, it takes, it takes a period of time in terms of once you've sort of laid your first draft down to the edit process. And then by the time it comes out again, it can be some months before you've sort of had any interaction with it. So by the time I got to right. go back and do the audio book, I hadn't seen The Good Hustle. I hadn't read it sort of cover to cover. I hadn't really interacted with the text for quite a few months. And I remember just reading it and thinking, oh, this is great. Who wrote this? <laughs> and it was a real sense for me when I was writing the book, often, and I'm sure other writers have this experience too, that it, the words just come through you. I, I don't believe I have any particular genius. I believe that that, that story was right to come out. It, and I just pretty much sat at the keyboard and smashed it up with my big man hands. And Okay. You know, broke two keyboards in the process. Uh, but it was just like, it just kind of <laughs> came out of me and I'd get to a point every day where I'd be like, okay, that's it for today. And I'd go off and do something else, come back, sit down the next day and just do it all over again. And so a lot of it's kind of like almost a stream of consciousness process where that information comes out, it's on the page. And for me, it came out in a very coherent and logical way. So I was, it was, I was having quite a fun time kind of rediscovering that work. Yeah. So it was, it was a multi-layered experience, but there was definitely a sense of, of, importance and being really present to what I was doing for others. It wasn't about recording it for me. It was about making sure that the best possible experience of that book was available for those people who, who were going to have an experience with it. And that's, I guess, very much in keeping with my values and my methodology. I think a lot of us think in terms of um, perhaps not specifically in business, but business as being part of our lives, that we tend to have a focus on, um, you know, the physical, the financial, uh, the the emotional side of things, but as you pointed out before, just to come back to your point, um, the spiritual side of what you're doing in your relationships with with people, it's in in a in a culture which is perhaps not so richly spiritually or religiously driven that we have in Australia, perhaps part of the the um, the first world. Um, what are we what are, are we missing something there that we're reconnecting with? Do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I 100% I think we are missing something and. I've been doing a lot of watching lately of docos on um, spirituality and this the, the Western spiritual movement, which I, I I watch with caution in many ways, Dave. And, and mm. as someone who's part of that that movement, it, it's it's a there's tension in that for me. So I'll unpack that a little bit for you and your listeners. In that, I think Thank much you. of Western spirituality um, is driven by a terrible lack and need. We want to be fixed. We want someone to fix us from the outside. We're unhappy and we're unfulfilled and we don't know why. And we look around and we've got wealth, you know, in the main I'm talking about sort of the, the middle class seekers who are the, in general the consumers of these types of books. Mm -hmm. We've got wealth. We've often got relationships and families and all the things that we've always been told will bring us happiness. We've got great jobs. But instead of that, those things are the things which are causing us great suffering. And this is something that I had experienced in my own life as, you know, going through and just wondering what, what was that feeling that was missing. So I personally was a great consumer of these kind of texts. And I always say sort of like, you know, the secret is almost the kryptonite of what exploded this world of, of linking spirituality with materialism. And that, that is still a very sort of strong thing. So we approach spirituality because we want to feel better, but we also want to get all the things. So, you know, it's like you just have to think positively and you're going to manifest a diamond necklace and the man of your dreams. And that connection is just an extension of our Western suffering. It's already where we are. So for me, when I started to really get into the, the philosophical side of Buddhism and yoga, and I have a great love of, of of sort of Eastern philosophy. So it was a really natural place mm. for me to spend a lot of time just like wandering around in my mind. And because yeah. my other part of my work as a, as a business strategist was working with fast growth startups. So I was very well versed in what a contemporary startup model from idea into market is. There was a real moment of sort of intense clarity I had when I was doing a yoga retreat and studying Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, which are the foundational philosophies of the eight limbs of yoga, what we in the West know as, as Ashtanga Yoga. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly realized that the path to enlightenment, which is a very prescriptive path, it sets out there are eight limbs that you follow in, in a somewhat linear way around sort of getting your mind right and your body right and your thought right, getting discipline in, understanding what the, the breathing is for in terms of settling you down and getting you to turn inwards and starting to really reflect on who you are and what that means. And with the ultimate goal being really that once you have a level of awareness that you dissolve into 
oneness, which for me is dissolving into that idea that I am not important, that what I'm here to do and the people I'm with are the things that's most important. And that's a very sort of in a nutshell version of that. But when I thought about that, I thought about the path to taking a startup to market or taking any business to market really, where you must have right mind, right speech, right body. You must have incredible discipline of thought to be able to actually push on through all the barriers. And once you get there, you must really use your intuition and you must become one with your customer. And it was like this explosion of going, you know, I'd never thought spirituality was apart from business, but I'd never had a way of articulating it that didn't make me sound like I was some kind of crazy tie-dyed woo-woo chick. And then something <laughs> I was like, well, A, I've got to drop that whole identity anyway. And B, that the way for us to do really good business, and when I talk about business, I'm talking about business that is profitable, business that is sustainable. So the people who are yeah. doing it aren't panicking and in lack and worried about money and not able to meet the needs of their customers. But it is fundamentally, philosophically, oriented towards being in service to others, the people we are called to serve. And whether that's serving them a vegan cupcake or whether that's serving them, you know, an a audio book company, it doesn't matter. It's like, how do we best give them those needs? So, but my general bigger thinking to bring us sort of back around to the question is that sure. what we are missing is a sense of who we are and why we're here. And we feel that that purpose is often outside of us. And it needs to be reflected in the things around us. And so my very strong message is that the first place to start is by turning in and is by really addressing who you are and not, you know, letting go of things. Because I think that's another terrible sort of Western misnomer. But it's about integrating all the things that we are, all the experiences we've had in our life. Stop living in the binary of that was really good. I love that. That was really bad. I don't want that, you know, attachment yeah. to that good, bad, that desire. That's the stuff we really need to be able to integrate and just be able to find a way to being present to what is, to who we're talking to, to what we're delivering. That is one of the hardest things that anyone can do, myself included. And, but when we get to that place and when we've rebuilt our neural pathways to really be thinking of others, to be applying those yogic and Buddhist principles, we tend yep. to just have lives which are nicer and gentler and kinder and are in service to others. And that is ultimately in service to us. I think that's like there, there are just so many wonderful, beautiful ideas around that. And I think um, you mentioned about the difficulty in getting to that kind of space, Polly. But I guess if, if, you, if you are listening to yourself on occasion, you, you will think back to times in the past week where you had a particularly good conversation with someone or there was, there was some, uh, you know, like a, a particular idea or set of values being, being shared where you can just feel an investment from, from either, either party, like you, you're informing each other of things that you need to know. So it, to mm. me, it, um, in a sense, it may be the whole, I mean, aside from, you know, ex existential philosophies that have studied the self and other for, you know, for centuries, but, um, but this, this idea that you can, um, it's, to me, I feel it's more along the idea of bartering. So you're actually, you're, you're exchanging value between, between the two of us. And to some extent, the money side of it doesn't really, doesn't really matter. And in a sense, the more you ignore it, sometimes the, the, the easier it will come. But I think the motive, the motive is that, to be useful and as you say to be of to be of service is really it's what you want to know about the people that you're that you're relating relating to and dealing with and in, enjoying your life with that that right. mutual mutual exchange of service you know becomes a very strong bond and you can sort of feel i mean you can count them among your closest friends but also among your closer business contacts i think they're the ones that 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 you remember and they remember you i think that's a really incredibly beautiful way of describing it and it really situates it well and that, that everything is an exchange. And, you know, I, without any scientific or, you know, evidentiary proof, I, I believe that we always show up in the conversation we need to be in at the right time, whether it's one that mm. the time we see as positive or not. I feel the same way about books. You know, so people that have said to me, oh, you know, your book literally fell off the shelf into my hand. And I thought, oh, well, I'll just read it. And then, lo oh, and behold, it was the thing I needed to have at that moment. And we've all had those conversations where we've just, for some reason, we've stepped into a conversation with someone that, was exactly what we needed to hear at that time. And yeah. when you think about the financial side of business, and this is something that, again, like I think we can't ignore finance and it, it can't be something that we're frightened of that we run away from. We have to make sure that we have a, a sufficient market for our product, that it's priced in a way that's sustainable. But the reality is I've always seen when people see value in something, they don't focus on the money. There is an absolute moment of true equal exchange, whatever it is. And I always say to people, you find that moment in your business where the person you're talking to puts their hand in their pocket, they cannot wait to get it, and they just, I have to have that now. It's like that sense of like, oh my God, I have to have this. And I feel that's really what you're saying is that 
when it's a really true exchange and you're freely giving, it just it's, it flows naturally and there's never a niggle because you know absolutely that it's it's priceless that you know absolutely the most valuable thing ever and that's the point we get to and I think we get there faster when we do it through really working out how we can give the most value to our customers rather than spending hours pouring over every last cent as long as you have a fairly yeah. good broad base for making sure that you have got enough profit built into your margin to keep you going the rest comes with service interesting really interesting idea I, 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 to, to me it's that difference between um you know, rolling up in a truck with a with a uh, a dump truck full of full of topsoil and dumping it and dumping it someone's property and selling them that to a certain price, versus actually being engaged with that soil and actually laying a garden with it and turning mm -hmm. it into something. So, so the, there's a there's a proximity that comes with with relating to others, which I think is is kind of has to be there to some degree when you're working in business. It's part of what attracts mm -hmm. you to to enjoying, but but it's not specifically about that. That's the way I love that you've extended that concept to say, well, we are talking about relationships, but they're not necessarily divine. They're not defined or, de or divine. That was an interesting slip. But um, <laughs> <I love> that. <laughs> Dave's but having a moment. <laughs> I am. Thank you. That's the one I was just describing before. So instead of things sort of sitting in a square box where things are defined and certain behaviours are expected and maintained and rules are followed, that that what can extend from that, of course, is that you're having a relationship with another human being. You're becoming part of their consciousness and what and what they're doing and you know hope and aspiration isn't necessarily something you need to exclude from that or, or one of the things that i really yeah. incorporated strongly from the the startup world which i think sort of speaks to that again in sort of a more technical way and exactly what you're talking about to extend your topsoil metaphor is this idea of, of ux or the user experience and how that's incorporated into taking ideas which haven't previously been in the market out to market and of course the method for that which i've sort of adapted to a degree in the good hustle is about creating a sort of minimum viable product and the, the idea behind that is that you aren't ever creating experience or product or service for a customer in isolation because ultimately unless you are creating what that person needs you're going to end up with something that never fits properly so in our topsoil example in this method you would go to the person standing in their barren ground and say hey what do you want to do with your garden do you actually want to garden or are you really busy maybe we should do something else here or if you were going to garden what sort of things would you want there and who would you like to give them to and what are your sort of needs and then you'd roll up with your truck packed to the gunnels with everything they had asked for and say, hey, look, I've got this for you at this price. Is that going to be what you want? And they would go, that's 99% amazing. And that, what about this 1% here? Okay, well, we can fix that in the next load. So yeah. you're never just rocking up and dumping top and going like, well, just, you know, it's going to work truly. It's, it's really about that conversation. And so that early conversation where before you've even put hand to shovel, you're saying, tell me about your problems. What are the things that really vex you in your life? and in the context of whatever lane way you're in in business. And so what sort of things do you think could fix them? And then it's not about saying, I've got this really great idea. Do you think it's a great idea? Which is sort of the classic way we do things. And I think often we have this yeah. very romantic sort of, we'll have a romantic idea, like I think this thing is gonna be perfect. And we'll sort of not really wanna hear the, the, well, it might be perfect for that test market of one, which is you, but for the, the wider, unfortunate <laughs> market, they're like not really interested. Yeah. And going out there and asking the question, having people sort of you know, shoot down your darlings and flames is quite, you know, actually you have to be very humble and you have to be very, very open to not having an attachment to your ideas as being the primary idea. And again, it's a really nice way to A, spend a lot of time talking to customers. And I often wonder, you know, in Tasmania where I do a lot of work, 98% of businesses down here are micro and small businesses. So that means businesses with less than two people. So mm -hmm. the 2% end of town, which is the big end of town, is kind of the small big end of town, but it's quite a big end of town. So the majority of our businesses are those micro businesses that you regularly see the statistics that something like 80% of them fail in their first year. Yeah. And I often think it's because people have this great attachment to their idea and they run out and do it and they just believe if they build it, they'll come. And usually what you'll find is, if you talk to people, you'll build it right and then they'll really come. That's a, that's a really interesting idea I've found um, um, reflecting on that in my, in my own business. I mean, one of, the, one of the qualities that you would hope from someone, I think, who is recording audio, that you have an ability to not only hear properly, but listen properly as well. And that becomes such a, such a huge um, benefit. You know, there are many, many times when, when you can just bread, breadcrumb a, a an idea which might be, look, you know, I saw this and I, I maybe that might help or 
or whatever, just leave them as big open questions. And, and, and the folk you're talking to will actually tell you the answer. They'll let you know what it is and they'll ask you questions back. You know, th this, is, this is what I'm engaged with. This is what I'm trying to do. This is the problem I'm trying to solve. Um, if you don't engage in that conversation, then as you were pointing out, then you sort of roll in there with a killer app. You know, I've got this procedure one to 50 to make an audio book. It works every time. It's an absolute killer. And you know, nothing, nothing ever goes wrong. The person says, well, um, okay, but it's not kind of warming me up to the idea of whether this is a great idea. What might you like to use the audio book for? I mean, do you want a book? at all. I mean, would you rather do a podcast? Are you just after some audio for promotion? I mean, there's, there's so many, there's so much stuff you could miss out on a relationship if you wander, wander into it with the, the killer app in your pocket and say, well, you know, it's either this or it's nothing, but um, more often than not, that'll actually add up to nothing. Yeah, that's, it's absolutely true. Too. And I've, I've really, I've experienced that lately having, I've been taking a, a, a new idea out to market and in doing it in a very structured way through an accelerator and the you know the first thing you have to do in that accelerator is interview a hundred people face to face about your idea and I mm -hmm. got about five to ten people in and it was absolutely clear that my idea was the market of one and that and it was really like oh I had to sit and I had to go back again and again and pivot it and pivot it and pivot it but it was such a good experience of just going yeah. You know, that, that idea is a good idea, but it's not right for how I'm pitching it. So I'm pitching it to the, the wrong people or I haven't, you know, I just haven't found that product market fit for it. But in listening, I had so many other ideas of just like, okay, so that's not what they want, but, oh, but this is a real problem for you. So I totally agree. And, you know, the thing is that there's a time and a, a place for a lot of ideas and often it's just too early for whatever reason and you need to have more trust in your market for them to take a bigger leap with you. So you find the thing that yeah. can meet their needs quickly right now. And as you say, like for some people, an audio book is, it's a really big bridge and their market isn't set up for that and their own self-belief right. isn't set up for that. But a podcast or even just a few clips for Facebook and to be able to put on Instagram TV or something is sort of, yeah. that's going to do the job and that's the bridge to the thing that they can take the leap at. So knowing when to hear that someone you might think is ready really doesn't believe they're ready. You can only spiritually bully someone so hard. So I've discovered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love your point. I mean, yeah, I think that's, that's probably, probably what I'm driving at too, is that you have this, um, you know, it's, 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 about, it's about getting to learn to people. And I loved your example about, about turning and pivoting the original, original idea, is that really you can, you can kind of choose in a way whether you want to uh, build the whole thing, invest, invest in the whole thing, you know, have this absolute belief in your own idea. And it doesn't do what you want it to do. And so then you have to go back to kind of, you know, rewind and perhaps try some different options. So, so maybe put it the other way, you know, turn the whole thing on its head. So you're actually doing your, your research, you're talking to people, finding out what, what it is that they're after, what, what acts of service will mutually benefit both of you and yeah. start from there because you're going to have to do it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so and it's so much better to do it when you haven't spent the money building your killer app, which might cost you, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. I did this fantastic ex sort of experiment the other day in a leadership course I was facilitating and we had a speaker come in to talk about design thinking, which is, which is basically that, that idea that everything is very much customer centric. And she got these leaders to do an exercise where they, they identified some of the sort of main issues that were facing their sector. And then the exercise was to create ideas that were the worst possible way to address those issues. Like oh, they, could brilliant. Be cool, they could be immoral, it didn't matter. And they would just free form brainstorm onto post-it notes. It was so funny because all those people who'd been really striving to fix <laughs> something suddenly just were like, well, it, 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 everything came out. And then so you, you put them up around the room. And then you all go and stand around and you talk about them and you talk about why. And they were really, truly, I laughed so much. I was in bits on the floor. And then that is the brilliant. I love the exercise that. is to take your top three of the worst, most immoral, illegal and dangerous ideas you possibly could have and then find the kernel in that, which is a really, really good idea. And every single one of those groups of leaders turned around and then came up with a, an idea that they could take out into a pilot into the market. And to see what happens when you really unhinge that thinking from I've just got this one thing that I need to deliver to like, mm. what, what is the funnel going to look like? What is the biggest funnel we could have? And then it's really, it's a really clever psychological trick to sort of get us to yes. stop hanging on to the things we think. So, yep. and also deeply fun. 
Oh my word! That the, I, I love that story. I yeah. mean, that's absolutely fantastic. Just take the whole whole thing. So we're going to build this business. What are we going to think about first? We've got to think about the benefits of it for our customer, the features of our product, and all that sort of stuff. And just I know. Go, no, actually, completely the other way around. And and I imagine, um, I imagine during that during that workshop exercise that you, I mean, I, I would imagine that a number of the ones you that that were actually discovered that were written down, you know, had had have been products and services that have actually gone to market in the past and people go, you know, just like, you know, just like these corn chips or just like that, you know, stupid brushy thing that we used, you know, that, that no kitchen could do without and all that sort of stuff. You go, wow, that we've actually been here before. <laughs> the fun thing about it was too, that I think we have so many unconscious biases and filters that we put in that. So the things that we just won't say, the things that are the worst, the maddest, the baddest, like, so we already have this terribly tight set of blinkers on about what, what we can do in the way, how we can solve problems. And we, we've already said no to things we haven't even truly explored. So we've de-risked ourselves unconsciously to the point where very little is getting through. So when you say, you know, when you really truly open it up to say the things you're never allowed to say and you've given absolute Chatham House permission to just go absolutely ballistic. And I truly, I can't repeat many of the things much as I'd like to that were yeah. suggested. But because you're doing that in a way which is safe and you know the purpose of what you're doing, it's really interesting to see how that frees people. It's like, you know, they can just blah, 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 blah and say all this stuff. And then, you know, some beautiful, beautiful sensitive stuff came out of that. So... I think it's, yeah. it was a really interesting sort of reflection for me about when we think we're being sort of open and creative and ideating that we actually don't realise that oh, we're dear. in this tiny, tight, rigid little box of our own thinking and our own perceptions and our own experiences. And only when we bust that out comprehensively mm. can we really mm. start to, yeah. to, to find what the real solutions are because we, we don't come in it with a preconceived idea. And again, you know, if I can yeah. bring this back to my favourite soapbox subject of, uh, of spirituality, Buddhism and yoga. Of course. <laughs> um, you know, that's the purpose of meditation. That's the purpose of being able to get our minds to a place where we can have no thing there. It's not about blissful blankness. It's about the capacity to be in a space where we are not making a judgment or an attachment or a belief with something else, which really allows us to hear what people are saying and to really allow them to bring us a solution without feeling we have to push our own ego-driven solution or our own particular set of yeah. biases back onto that. I think that's a really interesting point, um, Polly. Like when I, when I think in terms of, um, from my own personal experience, and, I, and I, I, know, I know I do this from time, time to time as well, that you occasionally find yourself in a, in a situation where you are kind of defending something. If you're, if you're, if you're bringing something to people which you believe they will like, that they that they may need, that they will enjoy, then in some ways the presentation of that idea um, can be tied up. And I think it's pride. I think I think it's probably pride that comes in, if that's the right word. I think it's um, ego more than pride. And ego, okay. And then well, ego ego says ego says that you know I've given a lot of time within myself in my own inner space um, constructing this you know really quite elaborate idea, um, and I've featured a whole bunch of imaginary versions of all of the people I'm going to um, <laughs> present it to. You're all, you've all, all been in there as well. And then we, and we come out on stage and, and talk about it. And then, and, then, and then people have got like two or three things wrong with it. And you're sort of going, oh, ow. Like, How very dare you. Ow, ow. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, oh. Like, and, and it's, oh, my goodness. And that's, you know, potentially it can lead to recrimination where it's, Oh look, I really should have thought about that, and I'll just have to, you know. Or, or and you can choose to just go back into that inner space again, and you know, re rebuild a whole new other, um, you know, ivory castle that that looks better this time, and then try and presenting that one as well. Whereas each time your poor old audience are looking looking back at you, going like, "I really love you, Dave. I want you to succeed. I'd, I'd love for this love for this to work." Um, but like, I have to contribute to your idea because like I'm part of your solution, and therefore part of your problem as well. So. You know, every now and again, I just notice those moments in my in my own experience where you kind of take a deep breath, as you say, and just go, right. So yeah, that's the that's the power of listening again, isn't it? That's the that's the power of um, you know just hanging back and leaving leaving your leaving yourself open. That you know you 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 can open those boundaries. That the the physical barrier between you and everyone else has got really little to do with relationships. It's it's how your heart and your mind and your spirit are communicating with those people. That's that's where the transport can occur and that they can say things to you that that 
you don't agree with or you think might be a bit half-baked or not quite the way I saw it, but they may end up contributing to your idea and ultimately um, gain their support and help you move forward and, and help you develop, develop this thing, which is about connecting people together anyway. But of course, when someone else contributes... Sorry, that was a very, very long explanation. No, <laughs> I just, I'm laughing Thank so you. much because I, I, it, was, it is a beautiful way to describe that citadel we live in where we, we're the boss. We've got all these people, often who are quite angry and oppressive inner voices who are shouting us down, telling us we're hopeless and we'll never make it. So we're placating them, we're building this stuff for them. And we, then we come out and we're already, we've already been through the whole ideation war process internally. And of course you come out to the stage and you're defensive and you're not listening because it's like, I've done this already. You know, so I've never heard it described like that and it made me so happy because it really is like, <laughs> we, part of it also is that we're, we're so attached to being right and we're so attached to, to sort of having people like us in the main that we don't want people to say, oh, actually, I think your idea stinks. Because we can't differentiate that they're no. saying, I think your idea stinks. I don't think you stink. And so instantly, and I've been to many a yeah. pitching competition where I've seen people in the question part of their pitch where they've had massive gaping blind spots, being really angry and defensive with the judges. And it's like, oh, whoa, whoa, little doggy. It's like, you know, we're here. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then you know that that founder is going to be difficult because that founder's not ready to collaborate and to listen. But I think mm. they're really important point that you made is that, you know, there is nothing without the customer. And this is why it makes so much sense in that, that lean startup and UX design world, that you, you start with a question. You don't ever start with something that you can drop on your foot because yeah. you need to go in with a totally open space to, to work with and to find out. It, and, you know, they talk about it, when I say they, like the, the, that sector of knowledge talks about it, like you've got a science experiment. So your hypothesis is that people would like to record audio books. And you have to go and prove or disprove that hypothesis or validate or invalidate that, which yeah. in that way makes it kind of a little less emotional because it's kind of like, so if, if you were to do this, would you use it? Yes or no. It's like you can really validate and invalidate quickly. And then it's like, okay, great. So I didn't just spend $100,000 on that app. So what is it you need? And so in this process of constant hypothesis, proving or disproving, validating or invalidating, you build an actual picture of what the problem is, what some of the opportunities are. But, and again, in the design thinking model, that model is the f some of the first part and the big work that's done is done around empathy. How do you actually empathise with your customer? And so in my model, that would be about the compassionate model of how do you sort of, how do you work in compassion with someone from a Buddhist perspective of like, what is their needs? What are the things that they want? Rather than kind of pushing it out there. But all of it really in contemporary business speaks to customers and compassion and empathy and understanding that being the first port of call. And it doesn't make sense to me that you wouldn't want to do it like that because I don't get why, I mean, I do get why people do it, but I think that it's so much simpler if you just go through that much more humbling experience of just being yeah. open and listening. And, you know, that's, that's really the, the crux of it. And people are so in, invested in you by the time you actually get to product time that they, they're falling over themselves to, to buy it and to support you because they knew they were part of that. And it speaks directly to that part of the ego which wants to have, wants someone to hear you and to see you. So when you see and hear your customers with respect and then give them what they want, it's a hundred percent formula for success. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, that's, a, that's a great story to me. Um, maybe a controversial question, um, Polly, but do you feel um, in, in your, in your writings or in your, in your personal philosophy, when you've been discussing it with others, do you think there's ever a, a confusion between, um, between philosophy and religion. I mean, to me, I, to me, I differentiate those two terms, but I, I wonder whether, I wonder whether sometimes people um, have felt they've been receiving a mixed message or uh, they might be confused about the fact. I mean, because uh, for instance, if, if you were discussing someone who came from a, a particular religious background or, or was attached to a, a particular institution, um, is there potentially a, a, a conflict that where, where they may feel um, that, well, you know, my, my philosophy isn't really down the Eastern path. I'm not quite sort of tied into that same sort of religious belief. What, what's that, do, does that ever become troublesome, that, that difference between uh, spirituality and, and religiousness? Um, it doesn't, it doesn't for me. And it's, a, it's an excellent question. And it's one that we could like literally spend about an audio book's worth of time discussing. So, okay. and I'm going to give you my opinion on this. 
And one of the other beautiful parts of sort of like of the Buddhist philosophy is it always reminds you that, that as someone who doesn't inherently exist because of the nature of impermanence, that anything I've got to say is always opinion. So I always preface anything I say, I think this is opinion, you know, this isn't fact. And I think a lot of us actually masquerade our own opinion as personal facts. So mm. for, the, for the kind of philosophies I work with, they aren't philosophies that that exclude other belief systems and i'm not interested in any way in having a belief system which is is privileged or preferenced you know i don't come from the school of my god is bigger than your god so i everything that i do and the work that i do is always about whatever belief system you bring i'm a, i'm a big fan of faith i think when people have a yeah. faith of any sort as long as that faith isn't out to dominate and to exclude it gives people an anchor. And so I really celebrate seeing people of all faiths who are living in that in the way that I, you know, that I think most, most religions are meant to be lived, which is kindness to others, compassion, doing unto others. You know, there's, if you look back at all of the fundamental doctrines, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, they all have a very, very similar set of, of underlying laws, yeah. which have been yeah. over centuries changed by humans not by the sort of the bodhisattvas that came before or so because i very much sit in a buddhist philosophy and a yogic philosophy neither of them are exclusive all of them fit no. in perfect lockstep quite the opposite quite else. the opposite yeah quite the opposite yeah. policy uh, poly actually in, in a visit to um india last year and, and just some of my readings mm. myself but it really coalesced on the on the visit that you um what perhaps one of the um differences maybe it is a, it is a difference but i have this i had this great sense while i was there that um that particularly hindu was about was, was about the it, it was rather than about exclusiveness it was about inclusiveness yeah, absolutely and one of the one of the uh, spectacular examples of that i think was that there was a um a, some sort of british tyrant who was there during the during the times of the raj mm -hmm. who, who was a, a you know very nasty person that you know done all sorts of horrible things and then had died, and there was actually there was actually a little shrine dedicated to this person, where 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 people of, of um, Hindu belief would actually go, and they they would actually go and and um, um, you know attend attend to this particular shrine. And to me, that was just the most incredible. Again, that big turning on its head that you know we we, we think of we think of spirituality as is you know as all about goodness and all about. But it goes much further, doesn't it? It goes into understanding and things like, and com compassion can look very, to me, that was the strangest look compassion had ever had. Oh, see, I, I, don't, I don't see that because I see that, you know, in, no. in terms of the development of karma and merit, it's always about, you know, for in the Buddhist language, it's all sentient beings. And it's a really interesting thing in the West, particularly because we tend to go, I love all those sentient beings who are just like me, but that guy over there who's a pedophile and that guy over there who's this, oh, I don't love them, I couldn't possibly love them. What, what Buddhism asks us to do is to understand that we are all born with the equalizer of suffering. And so while we are all suffering, we can't choose who we, who we want to give service to and who we want to be of service to and who we want to care about and who we don't yeah. because that, that automatically means you're not in service to all sentient beings. And I think in the Hindu perspective, that's again all about all of us being one. We all come back to this kind of notion that we're all one. And so it doesn't matter what other people are believing, you don't stop creating positive and, and good karma with them. You don't, because the minute wow. you have a bad thought or you're angry towards them or you don't put a beautiful offering on that shrine, you're creating a situation of negative karma. So in the Hindu sense, that, that, that's the dumbest thing you could possibly do. But I think that, again, and why this is probably too big a discussion for here is that... Sorry, religion, yeah. Religion, <laughs> I can't religion, help myself, Polly. <laughs> no, and I, no I, just, I, I love this so much. And, you know, religion is very different to spirituality. And I think... The problem with religion mm. is that it has a lot of rules. And if, you're, if you have fundamental rules, which are right speech, right body, right mind, which is yeah. kind of the, I mean, that's, that's a, the, the kernel of, um, of Buddhism, but it's also really the kernel of, of Hinduism. And, but, and Hinduism, we talk about it like it's a singular thing, but Hinduism has, you know, 300 million gods, deities, mm. there's different ways of worship all the way through. So that yeah. it's, and it's almost like saying, you know, if we talk about Christianity, like, so one person's Christianity is going to be very different to someone else's Christianity. And religion yeah. sits in there with rules and with, with all kinds of different things. So f to, for your original question, I always write and speak always from the disclaimer that you bring to the discussion your set of beliefs. There is no 
Yeah. There is no better or worse way of doing it. And you incorporate them the way you do. And particularly, it was a big thing with the Good Hustle, talking about God and divinity. And it, that's such an incredibly personal discussion for people. And But sure. the idea of how do you articulate something which has got infinite meanings for infinite people in a way that isn't going to exclude people or make them feel angry or... So, you know, I had to spend quite a lot of time in the setup sort of saying, you know, divinity can be anything and it might be riding a horse and it might be patting a dog and it might be, you know, spending time praying with Jesus. It might be doing mantra as a Buddhist. It might be going to a shrine. It might be anything and whatever it is, it's your thing. And it, it's this, you know, for me, it's not about teaching you how to do a thing which is so personal to you. And I'm quite happy to yeah. talk about what it is for me. But again, it's like, yeah. it's entirely personal. But for me, it's a feeling. It's, it, it's a feeling of emancipation from the weight of the world and that's really what trying to release that suffering is all about what a lovely what a lovely point of view i think to, to me to me the way I, I i hear the argument is it's is you know life life is um a, a good or a, a good or a bad life but life is life is probably about building relationships and and quite possibly less about um, building institutions it's a hundred percent about that you know i'm married to a, a cosmologist and a physicist so we had one of, you know, we've been married for 20 years and I'm only sort of giving the sidebar in that we had one of the most interesting discussions I've had in 20 years and I've had a lot of interesting discussions because John had been reading a book called, you know, sort of like, why is there something instead of nothing? And we spent hours discussing why is there something instead of nothing in, in, a, in a physics kind of modality, which is something I'm not particularly well versed in. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, it was really fantastic to be able to have super spirited conversations about, well, what would a... God created Earth look like, and how does that relate to a Big Bang? And what about infinity? And where are the boundaries in multi, you know, multiverses? And it's just so fascinating. And I, of course, went out and bought the book, and I've been devouring it. And it's the most fascinating thing. But you know, for me, that someone has a belief that isn't shared with mine. I mean, John fundamentally doesn't believe in God, and doesn't believe in mm -hmm. reincarnation, and doesn't believe in mm -hmm. karma, and believes that we're particles and we go into a box. But I would say he's probably one of the closest examples to a living body sufferer I've ever seen in the way he cares for people and anticipates there was needs and puts everyone first in a way that is strong and leaderful. So, we, yeah. you know, it's, it doesn't matter what other people think. What matters is how they are in the world and how they walk through the world with people. And that, if that's all you've got at the last moment, that's all you should have. It's, you know, that's the perfection. That's just such a beautiful closing remark, Polly. Look, thank you so much for chatting today. I mean, I mean, great. I think we could probably, I think we've probably got a series of about forty of these. Yes, please. <laughs> it's been an absolute delight, Tom, and I'm so, I'm so very excited about you and your way of bringing people's voices into the world through audiobooks. I think it's really important. I think voice is is the next frontier in every part of technology, and certainly as writers, you know, for us, it gives us such a different dimension to our work. So you are doing the good work yourself, Mr. Hustler. Oh, thank you so much. Well, it's all about inspiration and, um, and thank you so much for yours. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, listeners. Thanks,